the Habs are best and hockey is best yeah. when people give a shit and when there's something on the line. And uh, you know, and I know that we're only as good as our rivals. Mm -hmm. And so the same way that I hate on the Leafs, it's from a place of love and it's from a place of knowing that we need them to be good again. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have. Books really saved my life. Not much of a Bruins fan, eh? Not even, <laughs> kind of, yes. <laughs> There's a whole chapter in this book about your uh, disdain for the uh, bear, yes, yes, the bear big worshipers. Time. Yeah, the, the godless bear worshippers is what I called them. Yeah, um, yeah, um, fuck Boston. Is <laughs> <laughs> basically what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but first, I just, I having read this book, I just want to say it's it really is. Uh, Quite an incredible piece of work. Thanks, man. Thank uh, you. It's very I, nice of you to say. I'm not just saying that because we have the same publisher and <laughs> we're the same editors, but really, I uh, I couldn't put it down. It oh, sort thanks, of has a, a real personal connection to it that Thank I don't you. think a lot of uh, books about sports have. Oh, wicked! And uh, I really uh, I really appreciated that. Thank so, you very much. Um, just to get started, I'm going to ask the question that I'm sure you've been asked sure. many times in the last month. But <laughs> it's fine. why this book? Right? Why now? Um, well, basically, I. I saw a vital Canadian pastime that I felt needed some attention drawn to it, which was uh, the pastime of watching hockey, which sounds like nothing because we all do it and we all grow up with it. And I think as a result, we take it for granted. But I think in this country, this country where we are quite well steeped in the romance of the first time a kid plays the game, right. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a great deal of mythos around playing the game, but I, I see none of that for watching the game. And to me, that's just as, just as important, just as vital, just as fundamentally Canadian an experience. And, I, and, and one of the reasons that I thought that was um, when I'd watch hockey games with my friends, I'd, I'd notice this sort of dynamic would keep replaying out, which was, you know, we'd all we'd all watch the game and talk about the game that we were watching, um, but your, our conversations would go off onto these lovely tangents, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes based on what was happening in the game. You know, like a play would remind you of a play from another game, which reminds you of something your dad said, which right. reminds you of you know a party you went to in high school. You went to all these different kind of spots, and you kept coming back to the game and. You know, and it would and it would run the gamut from like, you know, stupidity to profundity. But like we'd 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 find these. You know, the, the hockey provide provided this really neat forum for relating to yeah. one another. And, and the book opens sort of with a with that sense of community. It's opening yeah. night. You're you're with. It's it sort of has that sort of feel of uh, Ken Dryden as the game. Yeah, to right. A extent. Well, well, that was the, the, yeah. yeah. I, I literally tried to write the fan version really? of, of of the game. You know, the, the Ken Ken Dryden's the game is the macro yes. experience of being a professional hockey player and I was like I'm going to try to do that for fit for being a fan so it carries the arc carries over the course of a season essentially yeah, exactly these reflections through and it begins in a in a uh, living room greeting with your friends talking yeah. about all of it and it's about the experience yeah. it's really about the action your reaction to it yeah. but also what you're feeling and the, and the, the tradition you're creating. yeah and the, and the tradition of like you know, friends filtering in through the door over over the course of an hour and a half, and everyone you know getting your orders in for supper, and all of us you know smoking far too much weed, and 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 um and you know and it was just like this this kind of thing. It became this 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 lovely this lovely tradition, and and I would see it replayed everywhere I went in Canada and everybody had an anal uh, uh, analogous experience you know when whether it was at your house your friend's house uh, the bar the stadium I, I found you know people relate to each other with this common ground and as a result people are incredibly kind of open and candid and mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know that's like that that seemed to me to be something special yeah. How did the process uh, come about to, to write the book? I mean, was it your idea initially, or did, how did that happen? No, I was, somebody was like, well, you should write a book about the Habs, because really? yeah. you've got a whole bunch of opinions and stuff. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, I was like, well, yeah, that sounds like cool. And I, <laughs> I you know, I, 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 I didn't realize how much I had in me to say, yeah. you know. Um, that was what, that was what the, the sort of big takeaway was like, I had even more opinions than I than I anticipated, and um, 
and I, I, I definitely wanted to write a book that didn't exist. I didn't yeah. I want there's a space on my shelf for this book. And 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 that applied to the way I kind of put it together too, is that like I, I wrote it for people that might not want to fucking read a book, you okay. know? And I and I I I I read I wrote it so that if you want to read it from A to Z, you can. Yeah. But it but you don't have to, right? Like that's why there are you know, there are essays and a short story and there's fucking poems. There's all sorts of different shit. And I tried to make it so that you could kind of go back and forth and pick a chapter that speaks to you and just live with that like a magazine kind of. You know. Right, so you can sort of jump in and out. Uh, and if if, if that's what suits you, yeah. Um, and is that sort of writing a, a short story, writing, how did you, uh, when you discussed that with, I know you worked with uh, Jim Gifford, <laughs> yeah. he was your editor, yeah. how, did, uh, how did he react when he sort of saw this sort of uh, <laughs> different kind of structure? I think it was probably too late for him to take too much issue with <laughs> okay. it. Uh, I, I was... Um, no, he, he, I, I have to say, uh, Harper Collins afforded me a great deal of, of creative leeway. I, I kind of, you know, I, I had some ideas. I was like, you know, uh, my dad was a real character. I could talk about him a lot. So I was like, I was a season ticket holder for two years. I could talk about that a lot. I made some movies about hockey. I'm sure I could find a way to talk about that. Um, but the more I kept going, the more it sort of, as it does, uh, I think in any creative process, it sort of revealed itself. And there were chapters that seemed to seemed to to want to be written that I had never occurred to me, you know. And and so then it was like my fault for adding work to my plate because like I was like I think a month or two before my deadline, I was like, oh. You know what I'll do? I'm going to write a military history style timeline of the Good Friday massacre right. between Quebec and Montreal, which of course then means I have to watch that game again and again and again uh, over the course of two weeks. And uh, there were many times where I said to my, you know, poor fiance Rebecca, God bless her, she's sitting right there, and I was like, "This is my fault. Nobody made me do this. Nobody's holding my mother at gunpoint. <laughs> this is all my idea." So, what was the process of, of writing a book? I know you're very busy with other projects as well. So, how did you go about putting? I mean, a lot of this is very personal as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. So, how did you find the the time, and how did you sort of find the, the frame of mind to be able to explore some of the things that you explored? Yeah. Um, <sighs> The, the, the kind of biggest hurdle for me was, um, and it's something I'm still not at peace with completely, which is that like um, I was raised with a uh, paralyzing fear about talking about myself. <laughs> You know, um, that was like in, in, in my family, we would much prefer you be uh, a complete failure but humble yeah. than successful <laughs> and, uh, and, nice. and proud. And so I was like, your laundry and your story is never the most important one, right? And yeah. so there were times where I was like, why the hell am I writing about me right now? Um, but I was able to reconcile that with the idea that I went through a bunch of stuff, and I think that there's probably other people that did too. And sometimes knowing that you're not the only person mm -hmm. having suffered something uh, can make it that much easier to to live through it. And um, and then it was just a question of like, you know, uh, refusing to give up, man. I I, I just like I, I I got into a really really solid routine of like. I, I, it was all about word count, okay. and if I felt that I had put enough words down, then I could take a break, or I could yeah. stop for the day. And uh, so I'd get, if I got to between 2,500 and 3,000, then I could, you know, get out of the basement and um, and have about seven words left in my head to use as a person talking. Yeah. yeah. I, having written a book before, I know how hard it can be sometimes to get to 3,000 words, though, when yes. you set that up. Yes, um, yes. Uh, how did you push through in that sense? Was it was just sort of diligence. Sometimes I was kind to myself, and I was like, 1750 is the new 3,000. <laughs> um, but no, I just, like, some days it was, it's weird, like, there would be some days where I'd get 3,000 out before lunchtime, and there were some that I'd be, like, be well after supper, and I still wasn't anywhere close. And, um, and I would just kind of go back to these different bits of advice that I'd kind of gotten my whole life about writing, and, like, the, sing the sort of most important one is the most obvious, cliched, simple one, but it's really hard to commit to it, which is like, just write every day, yeah. you know, because there's plenty of days where I didn't feel like it, or I didn't feel that, or, or what was coming out of me, I, I didn't, wasn't a fan, that great a fan of, but I knew that 
there will be some merit in this. Even if I end up throwing every single word of this out, mm -hmm. that has cleared the space, that's cleared garbage out of my head, and hopefully tomorrow will be better. But, uh, you know, there was, what I mean is, like, as I'm sure you found, uh, the, the, no writing is ever completely without merit, right? right? What, how much of it ends up in the final product, you know, you'll figure that out along the way, but I think it's more just kind of committing to it and making sure you get it out of you. Now, now this, um, this book is called Born Into It, and it's, um, it's really not just about being a fan. It's not mm -hmm. really just sort of being a, a Habs fan. It's, it's about the connection that, the very visceral connection that you have to this yeah. team for a variety of different reasons. You mentioned um, dealing with some difficult stuff and talking about it in yeah. this book. Um, maybe take us to the, the beginning in terms of what was your first, re how, what was your first connection with the Habs? What, why did you have a connection right away? Um, right. So I, I was born into a house that was covered in Habs crap okay. to start with. Like, I, 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 like, that was like, you know, I, I, I had no choice in the matter. My, my, my dad was like, you know, an absolutely religious Habs fan. Why, thank you. Uh, he, uh, you know, whether it was on TV or on the radio or in person, he never, he, rare was the game that he missed. And, um, and my mother grew up in a, in a house full of Habs fans too. And, you know, um, to be born in 1982 and growing up in that era in Montreal was like, you know, it, it was kind of impossible not to, not for it to connect to you in some way. And, um, and like one of my earliest memories period is like, and I mention it in the book is like, going into uh, mom and dad's room when I'm like three or four and dad's watching hockey mm -hmm. and it's the first time I'm seeing that and yeah. that looks just insane. And there's these real big men wearing colorful clothes and they're going super fast and all this shit and I, and dad was like, uh, you know, who's the, who are the good guys? I was like, I like the red team. And he's like, all right, yep, you made the right fucking choice. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly didn't pick the blue one. <laughs> You, you mentioned those several moments of sort of watching the game with your dad or, or hearing your dad watch the game. Um, there's yeah. one sort of funny, nice scene of your, yeah. it's Christmas Eve and yeah. your mother is reading um, Twice the Night Twitter Before, before Christmas, Christmas and your dad's syncopating it with uh, swears. Curse yeah, words, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's um, like literally at, at, at the end of every fucking line. <laughs> Twice the Night Before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature is stirring, not even a mouse. You fucking lazy fucks! Like, it was, uh, you know, it was, and it was literally Christmas Eve. Yeah. And, uh, and our living room was right next to mom and dad's room. So the wall, like it was, he was practically there with us swearing at the yeah. twice the night before Christmas. Yeah. Now, uh, your relationship with, with him was, um, was complicated at times yep. because of uh, addiction issues he dealt with. Yep. Um, you, through the first half of this book, have an interesting way of um, parallel, keep creating a parallel between the, the Habs rise and fall and, and your father's rise yeah. and fall and your own breakup of your family. Yeah. Um, can you take us through that process? I mean, sure. how did you sort of come, come to that? <clears throat> well, I, I knew that I couldn't write about my experiences with the Habs and my experiences with hockey um, with any degree of importance without mentioning my dad. Yeah. And if I was going to be honest and try to pl paint a you know picture of what it is to be a Habs fan, warts and all. Well, I would have to apply that same criteria to him, mm -hmm. and um, and so I you know I knew I had a bunch of like funny anecdotes, right? And I knew that there was some heavy stuff that had happened to him, but I didn't I wasn't entirely sure what I was trying to say. And then I was like, I I like rented a cabin. Um, I had this like, great idea to rent a cabin and go right and um, rented a cabin for five days, left after two, covered in bug bites, and I was like, I'm as much more comfortable in my basement. I don't know. I'm not that distracted at home. I don't know why I needed to go to the woods, but the one thing the woods <laughs> afforded me was this like, uh, you know, uh, that 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 so that great thing that's so hard to come by, which is honest to God kind of light bulb moment, mm -hmm. right? And I. You know, my dad was born in 54. He really came of age in the 70s. Uh, got married to my mom at the end of, in 79. And then I was born in 82 and my sister was born in 87. And life got shittier and shittier for my dad. That would be his POV in his movie. Um, because dad was, dad partied a lot. And dad was super, was a fucking criminal. Was like in prison and shit. And so, mm -hmm. um, but when he was 20, 21, 22, 23, 
you can you can do that and not necessarily pay the price of it, right? Like it's it's like uh, and and so he was young and and virile and alive and and by the way, so were the Montreal Canadiens at right. that time, man. And so, like I say in the book, you know, my dad was never more himself than he was in the '70s and right. the years before I was born. Like that, I just know. And and I was like. You know, Montreal English community is very small. Um, all families are like three degrees of separation away from one another. So names take on a sort of notoriety or a fame. And, and my dad's was one of them. And mm -hmm. it was like, I'm like the first kind of bearishell in Montreal to not be famous for like going to court right. and prison and shit. And, um, but what I saw with the Habs, and they had this golden era in the 70s, and then shit got harder and harder for them um, you know, almost entirely a downswing with the exception of two bright spots, two cups, right? And then I saw that that, that same kind of process applied to my dad. Shit got harder and harder for him with the exception of two bright spots in my birth and my sister's birth. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I saw that kind of connectivity and that they, those two sort of things dovetailed, I was like, oh shit, that is it. That's, 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 Everything I can say about my father is in that moment, you know. There's this lovely um, memory you have after the, the Canadians win the 93 Cup, and you're, I think you're traveling with your family near Rice Lake, because you're living yeah. in Oshawa at yeah. the time, uh, and your uh, father's writing um, <laughs> yeah. in, with fire and yeah. yelling. What was he saying? Uh, Le Gagnon de la Coupe, Stan Lee. And he was also <laughs> driving around the fucking backwoods with the windows rolled down, honking, Le Canadien sont la pa, 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 pa. <laughs> You know, um, it was like, you know, he, he was, uh, it was a ridiculous human, my father, but he was like, you know, um, that shit was always on his, on yeah. his sleeves. Like he yeah. was, uh, he had no, nobody to pretend uh, for, right? Yeah. And, and that, I mean, that's sort of, a, I mean, 93 is obviously this happy moment right after that. Even in Quebec, there's uh, the referendum yeah. that, that comes. And so, yeah. I mean, there's this. And that's when we fucking moved back. Right, you moved back right in the winter, like, right after. Yes, the the like this yeah. is like that's like you know, no, no, very, very few Anglo families moved from <laughs> Ontario to Quebec, <laughs> circa 1993-94. Yeah. But we were one of them, yeah. and um, God help us, and and like. <laughs> And our parents made us aware of that, too, yeah. that we were kind of, um, yeah, a, a, a real strong sense of that. I, 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 that was not a, you know, when you're a kid, you go where your parents go, right? Mm -hmm. And you just kind of check out, tune out until it's time to tune back in. And th this wasn't one of those cases. We were, it was quite, the, the ramifications of what that move meant were, were really, we weren't lost on any of us. Yeah, it, 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 it's talk quite um, specifically about seeing, I believe it's on, uh, say, Catherine Street, um, other Canadians from uh, different provinces coming yeah. and, and sort of trying to show that yeah. this is part of, you're part of our, our country, but then also the other perspective of it, the sort of, yeah. it's a little too little too late from the other side. Yeah, 100%, watching. you know, and like as an Anglo NDG boy during that time, it was like, yeah, it was, it was I'll just be honest, it was bloody scary because yeah. it was like, because it's also not anything I can, effect mm -hmm. right like as a kid you just are like what well, you know I'll, I'm going to bed tonight do I wake up in another country tomorrow you know and 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 I remember you know <clears throat> being kind of swept up in in that you know like we were, we were out and about the day of the big uh, uh, like no rally downtown Montreal and we saw all these school buses from across the country coming in and everybody was coming to tell Quebec how important it was yeah. to Canada and and we were there under that giant flag, Mum and I, and uh, and it was yeah, and, and and then I was in front of the polling station with a maple leaf painted on my face, all yeah. that stuff. Um, but as I got older, like that is an important moment to me, and uh, and, a, and a moment that I'm proud proud bit of Canadian history that I participated in, and I literally have like a maple leaf tattoo over my heart, so my my politics in that are are, are you know very well established, I think. But but one thing that I did. You know, as I got older and understand it, that, like, yeah, that is my POV based on right. the family I come from and the neighborhood I come from. Mm -hmm. There are whole, whole neighborhoods across the province that didn't see that day that way, mm -hmm. that saw it as kind of, um, yeah, too little, too late, and kind of uh, 
a vulgar display mm -hmm. and that it was, didn't come from the, that it wasn't earnest, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, now, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I understand why they feel that way. Now, and you, Ty, um, you, you speak quite um, clearly about the, also the connection, the, the cultural connection uh, within Quebec and Montreal to the Montreal Canadiens specifically. Yeah. Um, how important is that? How important is, uh, compared to, for example, Toronto and the, and the Leafs or um, mm -hmm. Vancouver and the Canucks, how mm -hmm. important is Toronto to the, sort of this, the complicated uh, identity of, yeah. of Montreal? Yeah, um, I think it's of paramount importance. Yeah. You know, I, I think that, like, for better or worse, you know, like, it, 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 um, it, it can kind of cause headaches when uh, hockey teams sole concern isn't just winning hockey games, right? right? Like, um, there are other considerations the Habs always have to have. Like, that is just the way it goes. Um, and, yeah, it drives me up the wall sometimes. It makes me want to fucking do, do my head in. But, like, I, I, there, are, there are times where uh, I understand why. I, I always understand why, but I also know that, like, any of what's good about being a Habs fan, mm -hmm. well, that's the cost of it. You can't separate it, right? If, if the Habs are more than just a hockey team and are more than just trying to win games, mm -hmm. um, if, they're, if they are a sort of political, cultural institution, mm -hmm. and, and ha then they should have considerations beyond hockey, winning hockey games. So like, you know, for example, you know, whenever there's a spot open, we're looking for a coach for the Montreal Canadiens, like it, you know, they, they have to be bilingual. Right. So that definitely, yes, does that cut out a bunch of potential candidates? Yeah. Right away. Um, but should they have to be bilingual? 150 percent right. they should. Like, you, how could you be a coach of that team yeah. and not? Right? So that's what it is. You compare the similar to sort of Barcelona and um, Celtic. Celtic. Yep, um, same thing. Very, it's, it's tied, and you, you, the idea of religion really ties into this as well. I mean, yeah, and it's like you don't, look, it, 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 I, I'm not trying to project sectarian stuff onto this, but it would be kind of facile and ignorant to pretend that there isn't any religious component to it whatsoever. Right. Like, um, traditionally Montreal is a much more Catholic town and Toronto is much more Protestant. And I think that, like, that is borne out by culture, by the sort of uh, legacy of each team. Mm -hmm. And I know that Montreal is also, like, it's, it's connected to the church, it's connected to French Canada, mm -hmm. and French Canada's right to self-determination and right to assert, assert itself. What the fuck is happening to my mic? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right in the serious shit, too. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it is just that. There, some teams are more than just a team, right. and, and that the, ha the fans of that team will you know, bear that. You mentioned, uh, near, near the end, you talk about uh, Las Vegas and just sort of envying the blank <laughs> slate that they have yeah. um, with their sort of superficial, oh, we're just going to show up and make the Stanley Cup final. <laughs> yeah. um, but then you also know that you know, there's something to the suffering as well. Oh, 100%. Uh, 100%. Sometimes I do, yeah, wish I rooted for a team that, like, yeah, it didn't mean fuck all to anybody yeah. because then, like, whatever happens is gravy. Yeah. And you don't have any sort of historical context to frame that in, mm -hmm. you know, versus us, where it's like any year we don't win the Stanley Cup, which is every single year, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been a shit year to be a Habs fan. Right. That's like, that's, that's the weight of, of doing what we've done in yeah. our past, you know? Um, and I actually think that that sense of history and that sense of obligation uh, and the weight of expectation um, has hindered us okay. immensely, immensely. And I think that like, I like, I think this, the Habs this season are kind of proof positive of what can happen when we all as Habs fans collectively like, you know, let go of the reins a bit, okay. like, you know, because like, I, I, I think that we all, every Habs fan expected this year to be you know, 82 fucking root canals in a row, yeah. you know, uh, um, and it just hasn't been that. Right. And because we were expecting that, um, there was nothing for the boys to lose, right. and they have everything to prove, and, and it's really exciting, and, you know, and what does it take? It takes a few, you know, a week or two of, like, good hockey games, and right now I'm like, oh, ça sent la coupe, man, we're getting, it's coming back, <laughs> cup's coming home. You get ahead of yourself. Yeah, always. Yeah, yeah you mentioned so maybe it's time for the Habs fans to, to take that hero's journey into the, into the wilderness. Yes. Uh, yeah, pretend we have zero Stanley Cups, I think, is, is, is the key. You know, like, 
Look, I love mentioning the number 24 as much as anybody. Uh, why wouldn't you? It's, it's impressive. Um, nice. <laughs> but, but, but I also don't know that that's doing us any favors or right. the guys that put on our sweater. Right. And there's also the number 25. Um, yeah, that's, and that elusive 25 is like, uh, that's, that's the Habs holy grail. Yeah, so it's 25 years since a uh, Canadian team has been to the, or won the Stanley Cup. The and Habs it's being. also, and you know, that's, that, that, there's, been, there's a big gaping hole in all of Habs fandom for the 25th Stanley Cup. Yes. So. Um, the, um, when you were, uh, af after the sort of referendum and sort of reaching high school and stuff, you, um, you end up obviously going into to LA eventually mm -hmm. to, to work in, uh, in Hollywood, um, but you talk in this book about sort of the isolation you felt at that time. Mm -hmm. At the same time you're sort of pursuing a dream, mm -hmm. you are also feeling uh, quite uh, alone. Homesick and, and super alone, yeah, and like, um, you know, I, I, I never, I was never trying to get down there, you know, I, I had like, so I'd been acting since I was 12, and I was, and you know, it would come up in conversation. Oh, you next stop uh, L.A., and I was like, oh God, no! I'll, I'll stop at 18. I'll mm -hmm. finish school in Quebec. Whatever money I have saved up, I'll live off of, and I'll write a bunch of like horror movies, and hopefully one of them gets made. Mm -hmm. And 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 life, you know, took me to the states, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the career I've had down there. But it wasn't, as it was never my raison d'être, and never what I was like trying to never where I was trying to get right. to. Um, all of the hard stuff about being there was that much harder. Right. And so I was like dreadfully homesick and uh, it's a really hard town to like meet and connect to people in. And especially when you're like 18 year old kid from Montreal and you don't have a driver's license. Mm -hmm. And in the like pre Uber era, that was like, you know, to not have a driver's license in Los Angeles was like, you might as well just go move to a fucking leper colony for all the like <laughs> interacting and with the city you're gonna do, you know. Yeah. And um, and 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 hockey and and the Habs, you know, w was a means of like saving me. Mm -hmm. It was a means of me saving myself. It was like I understood, and I'm not going to compare my you know time and my the beginnings of my time in L.A. to like you know, my ancestors coming across the Atlantic with their lives on their shoulders or whatever, but like, I understood what it is to be someplace far yeah. from home and to feel that much, to, to double down on home shit that much yeah. more and to see stuff that you took for granted, um, you thought was hokey or quaint, um, seeing it in, a, in the context of being on the other side of the fucking continent, you're just like, oh, I miss this, <laughs> I miss this, you know, and, and I, I like, Remember, I got a cable package at an apartment there when I was like 19 or 20, and somehow it and I paid to extra for it to include. Uh, and I'm so weird that this was an option. Much music and CBC News World, <laughs> <laughs> and so I would just have the two on uh, all day, and I would like, yeah, fall asleep and wake up to CBC News, even though I was in Los Angeles, because it made me feel that much, yeah. you know, it made me feel, for obvious reasons, yeah. And even with your, um, you weren't watching the games in isolation, though, you actually found friends there that you could... Yeah, uh, but, you know, LA's, LA's got a really, really serious Canadian expat, mm -hmm. you know, um, problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and, and so it's, like, I, I, w once you can find it, it is, it is really easy to beat the homesick blues if you're Canadian in that city because um, there were so many of us down there and you start to know which bars are our bars and which restaurants are our restaurants and all this different shit. And, and you can kind of um, commiserate and, and wax melancholy about stuff from back home. And, and, uh, and yeah, so uh, wa watching hockey was, uh, was a profound uh, part of surviving down there for me. Yeah. You know, um, later in life, you've, you've had the opportunity to actually create stories about hockey as well. So to, uh, you made Goons and, and, uh, and two Goons movies, yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, that process of writing, that's a story about a fighter. Yep. Why did you decide to uh, tell the story of, of a fighter specifically? Well, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I'll just be honest, and I say it in the book, I, I was raised in a family that adored hockey fighters and hockey fights. And, you know, um, and that's my dad and my mom. That's both of them. And 
I like I remember I have a very vivid memory of being like four or five and being in an airport in Montreal and John Cordick is mm -hmm. on a payphone there and Dad made you know made me go up and say what's up slugger and I bump fist with me and like that's like that's a big one for yeah. us you know and like those guys were heroes in our house yeah. and and more to a point that's what Dad did on the ice every time he played hockey he was like usually the um, the guy that would do that shit, you know. Yeah. Like I, I remember being at a, um, you know, a, a, a dinner because um, I'm I'm half Jewish on dad's side, and so I was at this Passover seder, and I was like 25 or 26, and it's a few years after dad had passed, and I met this couple, and the wife goes, "Are you related to Sayers?" I was like, "Well, that's my dad." She's like, "Oh wow, I dated him in high school," and then her husband goes, "And I played hockey with him," yeah. and I was like, "Oh, this." trippy and I you know and <laughs> because like as I said before like Montreal English community is real small and you know my name had a this like uncomfortable Trippy. weight to it yeah well and and not just with my like I'll, I'll put it this way and this isn't even kind of a joke my dad's first court date the judge looked at him and said are you John Baruchel's son so it right. goes back to my fucking grandfather like right. you know bad apples man and um <laughs> And so, so every time someone says, oh, I knew Sayers back yeah. in the day, I'm always like, oh, fuck, here we go. Just, <laughs> what, what anecdote is this going to be? And so I was like very frank with the guy, though, because like, I was like, you got to tell me, because to, to hear the way my dad put it, the only reason why he wasn't in the NHL was because like, he, he just didn't feel like it. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so tell, tell me the God's honest truth, like, what was the caliber of my father's hockey ability, you know? And, um, and the guy goes, how do I put this? And I'm like, well, that's a great start. <laughs> uh, um, and I started, how do I put this? Um, just like, no offense. It's one of those ones <laughs> yeah. that's always going to yield the opposite thing. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but he goes, your father liked to finish his checks. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, fair. That fucking perfectly lines up with everything I knew about my father, which is like, um, for better or worse, he just loved fighting, mm -hmm. you know, and he got his ass kicked plenty of times too. It's what happens. It's a cost of doing business, mm -hmm. but like he he uh, lived to fucking punch dudes, and mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. And I and as a result, I think I was like raised with an understanding of that role in the context of a hockey game yeah. and what those guys do. But that's a, that's always a complicated story. Like your father's life, it it was it's a, it was a complicated reality too. Like, yeah. um, you met John Cordick, obviously. Yes. He had a, had a, uh, tragic end. Yeah, really tragic um, end. And when Goon came out in 2011, just weeks before, yep. uh, I mean, that, that summer we were talking about the death of Rick Rippon, yep. Derek Bugard, and Wade, Wade Bielak, Bielak. All, yep. all players who died by, in, in connection to... Yep, They're what they did game. for a living. Yeah. yeah. How did... Um, Not disconnected from it, at least. How did you grapple with that at the time? Yeah, I mean, look, we, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a human being, so, like, I wasn't... I felt, like, a bit weird or um in a I, I i it felt a bit kind of uh shitty to be to put our movie out on the heels mm -hmm. of that but like you know you don't get to pick when a movie comes out yeah. you know there's a whole and 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 i also don't know that anything in our movie um steps on anyone's legacy you know mm -hmm. and i and and there's a lot of people would sort of try to bait me into saying something so they'd be like, how can you justify making a movie that um, glorifies this stuff? Right. And my counter was always, and this one might be, some people would call this a sort of sophism or a, you know, a cheat, but I, I, I don't think it's a negligible distinction. I say, like, I don't think the movie glorifies that so much as it romanticizes, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a complete difference. Um, to romanticize it, to crystallize it, and expand it for you know dramatic effect is one thing, but like, there's nobody that can watch both Goon movies mm -hmm. and think that they're an endorsement of that job, right? And 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 nor nor are they a movie. They're they're not um, they're not job. They're not movies that shit on that job either. They right. they they tried to, we tried to put them in something of a moral gray area, which is that like, what that lad does on that team is of great importance to the boys that he plays that, that he, he, he plays alongside mm -hmm. um it is directly connected to the audience and it is the purest distillation of the binary conflict we've all paid to right. see um but at the same time 
it has repercussions, and it's incredibly, it would be immoral to deny that, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, and so sort of my opinions about hockey fighting are that I love hockey fighters and I love hockey fights and I won't lie or be a hypocrite and I'll admit that there, you know, I have gotten hours of exhilaration out of the different fights I've seen throughout my life. However, I understand I'm not a fucking brain surgeon and if surgeons are all in agreement and, uh, you know, the players don't want to do it, it is not for me to disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, history has decided where hockey fighting is. It's dead. It's done. Yeah. It's effectively done in the North American game, which means it's effectively done in the world. Um, that doesn't change the the sort of benefits or the merit that it had. I don't think. Right. And you mentioned the story. It's a, every fight is its own story. Yeah. Right? It's. Um, now you're also very uh, you're good friends with Chris Nowen. Yep. What has that relationship been like, and why do you have a uh, why do you have a kinship with him? <laughs> um, well, to answer the first question, what has that relationship been like? Hilarious. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. it, it's it's uh, it's crazy when I say that because I was like one of my dad's favorite players, okay. and so the fact that like, you know, I'll say, oh, I got a text. Literally from Chris Nyland, like that's like a huge one. That's fucking crazy. Um, he is an un, he's like a super. He has done nothing but treat me with respect and kindness, and and always given me the time of day. And 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 he's he's a really really lovely guy that is deeply proud of what he did for my team. And mm -hmm. um, you know that's it's not horseshit. He 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 believes it, and he loves Montreal, and he loves the Habs. Yeah. And um, I don't think he'd take back any of it. Yeah, I mean, he also faced many demons. Many demons, That's many that. demons. But I also would go so far as to say that I don't think that the demons are exclusive to fighters. Okay. I think that de these demons are exclusive to people who chose choose like bespoke things to do for you know like you know it's in music, it's in uh, movies, it's in all sports. Yeah, there are you know when you're wired differently and you're wired so differently that you're good enough to be in the top percentile of the world, well, it stands to reason that you're going to have that many more problems, mm -hmm. right? Like, so it, it, I, so I, I don't know that it's, like, connected to... It, it's not disconnected from fighting, but I think it's much more about the sort of different way of life. You say, I, I'm probably misquoting it, but you talked about the um, not being sure whether a fighter is uh, has these outside uh, troubles because of fighting or he's fighting because of yeah the right that they're facing. yeah it's it's hard to know where where what causes what you know and you know i i don't know if my dad mm -hmm. you know if he comes from a house you know with two loving functioning parents and in like a sort of normal upbringing does he end up the way that he ended up mm -hmm. maybe may, maybe not you know mm -hmm. um it, it's it, but it's it, it's it, it's you, you cannot separate the two kind of like there there there's like there's a price to be to pay for everything and you uh, you spend as you mentioned earlier sort of the you create a sort of militaristic history of uh, the uh, the Good Friday massacre, which um, happened actually just you were two years old when it yes, happened. Yes, I was. So yeah. you have no actual memory of <laughs> no. it, um, no. and it, I don't know if everyone knows about it. But why don't you explain what? what yeah, it, what it's the a game in the playoffs uh, in '84, Good Friday, 1984, um, and I was born on Good Friday, 1982, which is a useless bit of trivia nobody cares about. <laughs> um, but uh, Montreal and Quebec. Um, very, 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 very serious rivals. Um, like, you know, Montreal, Toronto, Montreal, Boston don't even really come close to describing it. Um, mm -hmm. There's a familiarity breeds contempt aspect to the whole thing that um, the two teams just went fucking super hard at each other. And there's this one game that, you know, history has kind of looked back on and, and coined uh, the, uh, the Good Friday Massacre. But um, there's like... Uh, Fuck! What is it like? Like, there's like 40 different penalties. There's like hundreds, 300, 400 minutes total that that one game. This the third period starts late. Like they bring all the boys out to start the third period. They all start fighting. So the refs send them back to the dressing rooms, and they come back out 20 minutes later. So it was just like five-hour fucking hockey game. Um, <laughs> you know, players' careers were ended. Players' yeah. careers were made. Um, it is this 
important, crazy, fucking, what, arguably one of the five craziest, if not the craziest hockey game in NHL history. The other had the brother, fighting brother. And the yeah, you got well. both hunters on, uh, you have yeah. a hunter on each team beating the piss out of each other. It's, there are so many different storylines. Yeah. Chris Nyland fights like four times, yeah. individual, four different fights he's in, he gets into in that fucking game by himself. So um, <laughs> I was like, this is a pretty classic Battle and yeah. the stuff and like so and I read a lot of fucking war books so I was like I'm gonna write a <laughs> timeline of that. You're pretty tough on Bruce Hood in the in the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. the referees. Eh? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it is all almost all his fault. Um, yeah. Like, like, like I I I like his his job is to make the game run efficiently, run on time, and to dole out sort of penalties accordingly. Um, and just none of that shit happened. And, I, and, there are, you, and I watch the game in great detail, and I invite everyone else to if they want to and prove me wrong. But there's a shitload of times where he is like, sees a fucking Donnybrook of the entirety of both teams on the ice beating the shit out of each other. And you, you see him go... <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's just like kind of takes that uh, that approach of like you let the kid get his willies out, you know, and and I don't know that that's always the best thing to do in the middle of a fucking hockey game. <laughs> now, why did you decide that? I mean, this is a it's basically a chapter in the book. This whole sort of journey. Why did you decide that, that was something that was important for you to share with the reader about your um, your relationship with the game? Um, the I because I I was like I I, I look the. What makes what makes a history, right? A history yeah. is flashpoints and events, and a history is um, debts owed, uh, slights, kind of, you know, and uh, sort of slights unpunished, and all these different things, and and victories, and 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 it's not just games won and championships won. There's right. there's there are a hundred thousand more storylines of importance to me, yeah. you know. Um, you know, like there, there, there is player to player uh, rivalries as well, and there's old sort of uh, beefs that carry on over the course of seasons. You know, there's a whole bunch of different yeah. things to find it to find interesting, and to uh, to find emotion in, and that one, that particular game, mm -hmm. is like because it encapsulates a tremendous amount because the Habs Nordiques rivalry is many things and not and it's not just that we're 2 hours away from each other it's it's that um it's it's uh the, the Nordiques come to life shortly before circa around the first referendum yeah. and and the Habs have always had this um at times, kind of strange relationship with Quebec sovereignty because, like as I said, like it is directly connected to um, to French Canada standing up yep. on two feet and looking the rest of the country in the eyes. Um, the Habs are directly connected to that. And mm -hmm. furthermore, if I grew up in the 30s or 40s, by virtue of me speaking English and growing up in NDG, I wouldn't have been a Habs fan. I'd have been a Montreal Maroons yep. fan. Um, well, the Maroons folded, and we all kind of became Habs fans. Um, the Nordiques, it was like, it was almost like it will take the kind of separatist bent of the Habs fandom yeah. and give them a whole team unto themselves, right? And, um, and it's also like O'Keefe versus Molson. Um, there's, there is, there's also this really not important narrative of the rivalry between the two cities, which doesn't exist because Quebec City is not a city. It's just a bunch of old stuff, which yeah. is nice to see at Christmas time. But if, you know, the, the, the old city is lovely, but let's, let's be honest. <laughs> but, but, um, but no, look, what the, the essence of sport is competition and conflict, yeah. man, just like the essence of drama, okay? Yeah. And so Montreal and Quebec is that times a fucking thousand, man. And, and the, my, my argument about being a hockey fight being a pure distillation of the rival, rivalry we've gone to go watch, you know, the, the conflict we've, we've all paid to see, mm -hmm. um, it, th th this, is, this all kind of is in that sort of world. And the fact that, like, there's literally three fucking Donnybrooks in one game yeah. tells you how much these two teams actually hated each other. Yeah. It wasn't WWE crap, you know, and, and they've hated each other for a long time. There's a lot of crazy anecdotes from when they used to have, they, they used to send the Habs 
up to Quebec and send the Nordiques down to Montreal on the Via Rail. And sometimes the teams would be on the same fucking train, and there are literally anecdotes of them beating the shit out of each other, like Donnie Brooks in the fucking dining car. Like, at that level, it's not, you know, when people say, oh, come on. Yeah. I, I, uh, players don't care about teams. The players, they're just doing their job. They have no sense of loyalty or sense of, um, you know, uh, gang warfare, yeah. tribalism. Horseshit. There are, there are cases where they do, and Montreal, Quebec is one of them. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned, um, uh, you, you write a letter literally to the Nordiques uh, yep. in general and say you hope to see them in hell. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, within that, um, you also lament later on in the book, um, you know, like you're discussing the reality of the NHL today yeah. and how um, you know, there's been this sort of sudden expansion, there's a team in the desert, um, and, there's a, and Quebec doesn't have a team. So would you like to see a team? Absolutely. Yeah. So like, I hate the fucking Nordiques, and yeah. that is the highest compliment I can right. pay them, right? <laughs> Okay. There are no hate emails to the Vancouver Canucks because they're a fucking non-entity, man. Yeah. Like, and and the but the Nordiques, yeah. what's that? Or the Blue Jackets, yeah. or the Blue Jackets, yeah. man. Like, there are just like a bunch of teams that I just couldn't care less about. Um, and I know that the Habs are best, and hockey is best yeah. when people give a shit and when there's something on the line. And uh, you know, and I know that we're only as good as our rivals. Mm -hmm. And so the same way that I hate on the Leafs. It's from a place of love, and it's from a place of knowing that we need them to be good again. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, you don't really hit on the Leafs. You suggest you hope to see them in hell. That's what you said, right? <laughs> um, and I call them, and I and I try to say that the Leafs are like, it's it's not quite hate. It's more right. just like your insufferable cousin that you don't <laughs> want to, you know, like like I I I just want our rivalry to be meaningful once again. Right. Because Habs Toronto has been play acting for a decade, and it's yeah. been like historical reenactment. It's been like I put on my red sweater, you put on your blue one, and we both pretend that this means something because it used to, and it just fucking doesn't. And I wish it did. And I remember, you know, and because I remember even back, like literally like 10, 15 years ago, when Matt Sundin was captain and Saku Koivu was captain, yeah. god damn, those two teams and hated the shit out of each yeah. other, and that made for awesome hockey. And the game was better for it, and Canada's better for it. Like, that, that's the thing Canada needs for the Canadian rivalries to be the strongest ones in the game. And Canada needs more hockey teams than we, are, than we currently have. And I would, I'm gonna make a bold statement, the Americans need far fewer hockey teams <laughs> than the ones they currently have. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you must have been happy when Winnipeg returned that. Oh man, yeah. I, incredibly because we shot the first yeah. goon in Winnipeg and we shot at the MTS Center where, yeah. the, where the Jets play now. Um, and so if, you ever, if anybody watches the first goon, any of the scenes of Z Xavier Laflamme at the World Juniors playing for Team Canada, that's at the MTS Center where the Jets currently play. Yeah. And you know, when we made that movie there, we made it on the backs of Manitoba boys. Uh, shitload of amazing, amazing hockey players come mm -hmm. from that province every year. The ones that don't make it in the NHL are some of the best I've ever seen. Um, and and, and we, so we got this incredible pool of hockey talent to make our movie yeah. with. And, and it was also, beyond that, it was that town fucking deserved it, man. Mm -hmm. I, and I knew it. I knew that when it came back, when that team came back, the, that the, the city would support it like, you know, Winnipeg is far from the wealthiest part of Canada, okay? And so a very conventional wisdom would dictate, oh, there's no way they can sustain a fucking yeah. franchise. Well, motherfucker, watch yeah. any Jets game. That's the real deal. Yeah. That's the lesson that every American expansion team needs to learn. Yeah. I had the privilege of being at the first game back. And oh, I how cool. Just the, uh, the emotion. Right? Yeah. And it, the it's, return of something like that. Oh, it's, it's, and, and it's like, and it still means what it means to them every yeah. day, and it's like, you know, I, I, th that, that city deserves it. Now, um, just to, to end off, at the end of this book, um, you, you sort of have this sort of, um, have this sort of kaleidoscope of memories and things sort of coming mm -hmm. um, together, and you're living in Toronto, your family's here, mm -hmm. uh, life is here, but you've got, you know, the ghosts of your past are still looking back on mm -hmm. your father, your grandparents, even the legends, John Bellevue, yeah. Ray Reese Richard, it's all part of you yep. in this integral connection. And you talk about um, how, you know, the, the, your, you end the book sort of at the end of the last season, and you said, this season is every season. Yep. Um, and then you, you end with a quote, um, to you from falling hands, we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. Yep. Uh, now that's from in Flanders Field, yep. and it's located in the, um, the Habs locker room. Dressing room, yep. 
Why, why did you decide to end with that? Um, because it, it, in, that, in that sentence is everything. It's, it's it, the torch passed from generation to generation. The torch that you know, my dad passed to me. Mm-hmm. Um, the torch that the city passes on to its citizens every single generation. And I, you know, I know that my experience is my experience, but I also know that it's indicative of a shitload of Habs exper- other Habs fans' experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, that even if I live my whole life and never see a cup come to Montreal, mm-hmm. I do it all over again, and and I can't wait for somebody to take my place. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like. You know, because being a sports fan is an incredibly stupid, silly waste of time. Let's yeah. be honest. Like, there's no reason to do it. We exert no fucking control over it. Mm-hmm. I don't get anything out of it. Like, I don't get paid. I don't get food. I don't, like, nothing. Ha- you know, like, <laughs> quite the opposite. I yeah. spend a great deal of money, yeah. right? You know? <laughs> um, and, and it's like a bunch of guys playing a game. Yeah. And, and, like, so there are you know, tons of hours in front of a mirror being like, what the fuck are you watching this for? Like, why do you care so deeply, right? Yeah. And like, but that's the thing. That I would go through every experience I've already gone through again. The, you know, that, that's, that's, it's like, um, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the uh, essence of fandom.